Hello boys and girls, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. Today we have this really beat up, broken old chronograph on the bench. So let's see what we can do with it. See the crystal is broken, the hands are worn, dial looks pretty good actually, but the case not quite so. A lot of dirt, see the crown has a different color. The gold plating has worn through quite a few places. So yeah, a lot of work to do here. So let's get uh, moving. So you see the watch is not running. And honestly, if anyone thought that watch would be running, then they should really play the lotto. But inside it looks pretty okay. We see the balance does uh, oscillate, so that's uh, one of the most important things whenever we look at old watches like this. If the dial is fine and uh, the balance is fine, then uh, typically we can save the watch. So let's see what we can do with this. The movement is an old uh, Landron 48 and they have uh, a little peculiar way of uh, using the pushers for the chronograph. You can maybe see that the pushers have small grooves in them and uh, into these grooves the ends of the operating lever and the reset lever fit. So it's easier to simply uh, open uh, those screws up and take uh, the pushers out that way. And we see the dial actually looks pretty okay. The hands are a bit corroded and the plating has come off, but uh, we can uh, deal with that. The dial is secured with these old uh, dog screws, which can be a little bit fiddly, but uh, we'll manage in the end. And then we can put the dial and the hands away safely. It's a little bit difficult to see, but there's a lot of dirt in the movement. I see the barrel wheel is like completely jammed up. And that might be the reason the watch uh, is not running. We tried to let down the mainspring, but it's just stuck, so uh, we'll have to be very careful uh, going forward. I mentioned that this movement is uh, Landero 48 and that is uh, one of the most successful chronograph movements ever made. I've talked a little bit about, uh, let's say, the traditional chronograph makers in Switzerland before and uh, Landero was uh, one of them. Founded in the late uh, 1800s, they initially made some uh, very high-end uh, column wheel chronographs. But then they kind of struck gold uh, with their uh, cam uh, shifted ones. And uh, this uh, one, the 48, and its uh, family members, 148, 248, and so on, were produced in millions. And this was back uh, before globalization. And looking at the movement, it's uh, quite simple. There are a few parts that do a lot of things, like the cam and the hammer in one and uh, simple springs and uh, not a lot of parts actually. We're still uh, giving a very good performance, a sturdy movement, but it cannot uh, withstand uh, yarn. Look at this, this is amazing. Little piece of yarn in the clutch wheel here. Amazing. Well, maybe not yarn, but my kittens would think so at least. Let's see if it runs better. Yeah, that looks uh, like it might actually work. And this could of course be the reason the whole watch had stopped. Because the clutch wheel is always in contact with the driving wheel. So if the clutch wheel cannot move, then the entire mechanism will stop. Given that the Landron 48 family uh, was produced in so many uh, pieces, 
It ran from 1937 through 1970. You will still find watches with it. Oh, some more dirt. This time on the balance uh, wheel pivot. So you will still find watches uh, with it. And they might still actually run very well and perform very well. See, somehow we managed to loosen up the mechanism, but uh, something is still not quite right. But if we cannot let down the main spring uh, with the crown or uh, the ratchet wheel or the crown wheel, then uh, we can uh, let it down as I did there with a couple of tweezers uh, on the center wheel. And someone's been a dirty watch movement. I hmm. think we need to uh, clean you up a little bit. Oh, dirty. There are no service marks inside the case back. But there are a few marks here and there, so... Um, I do think the watch has been serviced, but the screws are also very nice. So it might be that this watch hasn't been serviced in, I don't know, 50 years. I talked a little bit about uh, the Landro watches uh, in my own collection video. The peculiarity with this uh, specific family of uh, Landro movements is that uh, the top pusher starts the chronograph, but you're sort of expecting that it also pauses the chronograph. But the pausing and the reset is actually done with the bottom uh, pusher. So if you do come across a vintage chronograph uh, with uh, two subdials, one for the minute counter and one for the running seconds, and the pushers work as I just described, then chances are good that it's uh, Landron 48 uh, family. Which is actually a pretty good thing, given that there were so many movements made, meaning that there are also parts available. And color me surprised. That tech was actually uh, unintended, but uh, kind of like the dramatic effect. Quite surprising uh, that uh, the barrel is uh, not as dirty as the rest. You see the parts are so dirty that we're going to try to uh, clean out most of the teeth with uh, some Rodico. This is uh, the crown wheel. And we are going to pre-clean pretty much the entire movement in uh, the ultrasonic. Otherwise we'll have to change uh, the cleaning fluids in the cleaning machine uh, pretty much for every jar. Look at this man. 50 years worth of dirt. And I guess it proves also that uh, the watch is not water tight. Otherwise, how would all that dirt get in? We pegged all the jewel holes as well. So let's get the pre-cleaning going. And from one cleaning to the next. So while we let the machines do the work for us, let's have a look at the case. And that is real dirt, man. The spring bar is very difficult to get off, but uh, just between you and me, 
I don't think we're going to reuse them anyway. Kind of impressive all the dirt they managed to uh, put into this case. Actually, I think I had to change my tissue there like three times. We're also going to have some difficulties uh, reusing the crystal. So I think we'll just replace it. Let's also pre-clean uh, the case in uh, the ultrasonic. And this time I'm going to spare you the noise. Sorry, spare you that noise. Because I have another noise. We're going to have to remove uh, what's left of the gold plating. Turns out the case is actually made by stainless steel. So that's kind of a good thing. What's not a good thing is that uh, the crown tube is not a tube. It's part of the case. So that makes it a little bit difficult to uh, polish it uh, well. So I did polish it a bit better off camera and then we're ready for uh, the gold plating. I have this uh, very nice little setup. Super easy to use. So we first uh, cleaned the metal with this first solution and then uh, now we're running it through this uh, nickel strike because it is uh, steel. So you see these little bubbles and then we'll let it sit in uh, the gold bath for uh, about 15 minutes. And then it comes out uh, nice and shiny. And then we kind of repeat that same process uh, with the hands. We first uh, get off uh, the old uh, plating and the corrosion and then we uh, run them through uh, the same gold plating process. have to be a little bit ingenious though with uh, getting them to fit there. With all that ready we can uh, turn back to the movement. Given that this is an old uh, watch before uh, Inca Block, well not really before Inca Block but before Inca Block became mainstream. So we have to uh, disassemble the whole balance. Takes a few minutes extra, but it's uh, not that much effort. Steady, steady. Tiny little screws there. You might remember that the mainspring was not entirely new, but we have a new one. When putting in a new mainspring like this in the packaging, then it should actually be uh, sort of pre lubricated from the factory. But in these old watches, I do like to put in a little bit of uh, grease at the bottom of the barrel. I don't think that hurts. Most things are fine in moderation. And with the barrel ready, we can oil the bottom capstone as well. And then let's see if the balance is willing to uh, rotate. And that looks uh, just fine. And that beautiful blued hairspring. Very nice to see. All right, let's get uh, the movement put back together. Gonna do what we normally do. Put the base movement back together first and then see that it uh, runs and runs well. If it does, then we can uh, continue with the chronograph module. Well, chronograph parts rather. We're using this uh, Fixo drop. It's uh, something called Epilam inside it. And the Epilam uh, makes uh, it uh, difficult for uh, lubricants to creep. So it basically helps the oil stay where we want it to stay and not uh, creep anywhere else. And then we're going to clean the pivots in some uh, pithwood. 
so they don't rub and leave residue inside the mechanism. As is common with the chronographs from this era, the whole uh, winding mechanism, so the ratchet wheel and uh, the crown wheel as well, is uh, on the underside of uh, the three-quarter bridge. So we're using some uh, D5 oil, or HP1300 to be honest, but pretty much the same. And with the bridges for the train of wheels uh, in place, we can turn the movement around and uh, put in uh, the keyless works. And the keyless works is called keyless because there is no key. There used to be a key. In the old days, uh, you needed a key to wind your watch and even to set it. But it's stuck with us. Kind of like in uh, Norwegian. When we talk about flushing the toilet, we say pull down the toilet. And the reason is that in the old days there was a water tank uh, like two meters above the toilet. So you had this little rope. So when you pulled the rope, you opened the tank and the water came flushing down. So you still say pull down, even though you don't pull down anymore. These things uh, tend to stick uh, with the language for a long time. As I hope you can see, it's a pretty simple mechanism. And that is, of course, a key reason why it's been so uh, popular. It is uh, easy to work on. So we're almost ready to uh, check that the base movement uh, works as it should. We need to uh, lubricate the pallets. So what we do is actually lubricate the exit pallet stone. Put a little bit of uh, oil on its face. And then we rotate the escape wheel so that each tooth uh, gets a little bit oil on it. And with that uh, fixo drop that oil will stay in place uh, very well. All right, moment of truth. See the balance is oscillating very nicely. It's always good to see. Let's put some oil in the jewel uh, holes, in the oil sinks. And then we can demagnetize and uh, put the watch on the time grapher. And that's a very pleasant surprise, I must say. We need to regulate it, but uh, straight lines and good amplitude. So in the end we managed to get it uh, running very nicely. Very happy to see that. So with the base movement running uh, nicely, we can turn to the chronograph. I'm going to put in the driving wheel first. Now we can put in the clutch. Now, not everything that looks like a screw is a screw. In chronographs, as I pointed out in the Longin Monopusher video, there are always some eccentric screws. And these aren't really screws, they have a screw head, but that's just to be able to rotate it. And when you rotate it, the part that's connected to it will move a little bit back and forth. And that is to ensure that uh, the depth thing, so how the wheels uh, mesh, how deep they mesh, is correct. General rule of thumb is that uh, the chronograph wheels should mesh uh, about two thirds of the tooth depth. So one uh, tooth of one wheel should go uh, down to two thirds of the engaging tooth on the other wheel. You can see that I stopped the uh, movement for putting in this little uh, tension uh, spring. 
whenever working very close to uh, the balance wheel uh, I think it's better to be on the safe side than not and yes I learned that the hard way this uh, hammer combined hammer and cam it's a pretty cool uh, design it was changed a little bit in uh, later versions, but it's a uh, good design. We need to make sure we either lubricate uh, the hammer ends uh, or the hard shaped cams on the chronograph wheels. And we're using 9504 there. You can also use Molecule DX for instance. And with uh, everything in place, let's start the chronograph and we can check uh, how the minute flips over. Yeah, that looks just fine. The dial is uh, in beautiful uh, shape. My wife uh, thought I should have uh, removed that little uh, spot at uh, 11 o'clock but uh, I decided it's time to show who's the man in the house. Please baby if you see this video uh, that was just a joke. Huh? All right we cased uh, the watch and we put uh, the pushers back in the same way we took them out and we can put uh, the dial back on and the hands now one uh, consideration whenever you're trying to restore a watch like this do you want it to restore it so it looks let's say brand new or do you want to try to let it look a little bit its age and as viewers of this uh, channel know, I prefer to uh, let a watch look its age. But these hands, for instance, were so far gone that we had to do something about them. But we didn't go all the way. So we didn't make them completely brand new and shiny. And a little bit the same uh, with the case. I think it looks much better, but I didn't want it to look uh, completely sort of fake and shiny. So uh, let me know in the comments uh, how you feel about this approach. Let's start the chronograph and let it run for a few minutes. And then let's try to reset it, see if both hands go back to zero. Yeah, that looks just fine. Put in a new glass, a new crystal. It's plexiglass in all of these old watches. And with the watch on the fitting strap, let's uh, see if there's any difference between then and now. Let's put it on the wrist and see how it looks there. Well, that is a pretty fine uh, vintage chronograph, I think. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then uh, click like and subscribe and share it on Facebook and what have you. We'll be back with another video shortly. Until then. Ta-ta.